Welcome to Beekeeping Today podcast presented by Bee Culture. Beekeeping Today podcast is your source for beekeeping news, information, and entertainment. I'm Jeff Ott. I'm Kim Flottam. And I'm Kirsten Trainer. Today's sponsor is Global Patties. They're a family-operated business that manufactures protein supplement patties for honeybees. It's a good time to think about honeybee nutrition. Feeding your hives protein supplement patties will ensure that they produce strong and healthy colonies. By increasing brood production and overall honey flow, Global offers a variety of standard patties as well as custom patties to meet your needs. No matter where you are, Global is ready to serve you. Visit them today at www.globalpatties.com. Hey, thanks, Sherry. We really appreciate our sponsor support. Without it, we would have a very difficult time bringing you the podcast on a weekly basis. With that, thanks to Bee Culture Magazine for continuing their presenting sponsorship of this podcast. Bee Culture has been the magazine for American beekeeping since 1873. Subscribe to Bee Culture today. And while you're there, check out Bee Culture's Beekeeping, your first three years, a quarterly magazine for beginning beekeepers. We also want to thank Two Million Blossoms as sponsor of this episode. Two Million Blossoms is a quarterly magazine dedicated to protecting all pollinator insects. Learn more on our Season 2, Episode 9 podcast with editor and our guest co-host, Kirsten Trainer, and from visiting www.2millionblossoms.com, and that is with a number two. Hey, everybody. Thanks for joining us. Hey, Kim. Hey, Kirsten. How y'all doing? Good, thank you. How are you? Good. Doing good, Jeff. All right. Well, the, the gang is all back together. So, Kirsten, how's Berlin? Still good? Still standing after the last in the last two weeks? Yes, um, Berlin is definitely still standing. We had a cold snap, which messed up my experiment, and so I very quickly scrambled um, because my colonies were had cannibalized the brood I was trying to raise. Um, but thankfully, I was able to locate a commercial beekeeper who had not yet treated for varroa, and I was able to buy some bees off him. And so I have been spending the last two weeks watching individual bees emerge, removing any varroa mites on them, and tagging them with either varroa tags or non-varroa tags. It's been kind of time-consuming and fascinating to watch varroa that close. Oh, my gosh. I bet your eyes are crossed. Well, I'm starting to have slight nightmares of varroa mites crawling on my skin because my (laughs) hands were warmer than the room. Um, And you could sort of, like, feel them tickling your arm. (laughs) And I collected them all into a little vial. So I have about 400 mites in a little glass tube. At the bottom is glue, and it, it feels quite satisfying knowing that they're in there and cannot get out. <laughs> you start watching your, oh, is that a new mole? No, oh, it's a for all mite. <laughs> it's, I'm glad you're doing it. I'm sure it's for a good, good cause ultimately. It is for a good cause. So I'm actually going to be talking about this research at the up-and-coming NAPSI conference in October. And NAPSI is what? The National Association for Pollinator Protection Campaign. So I had received a small grant for them for funding a tracking system. Oh, very good. Well, well, is that that an open uh, open, uh, meeting? Um, I believe it is an open meeting in that you can register in advance. I think there's a $25 fee. Mm -hmm. Um, but they have quite a lineup of speakers, and there's, I think, eight presenters on on honeybees that are in a special session. Oh, great. Well, we'll make sure we include that link in our show notes. Anybody's interested in going out and checking. Yeah, it's always a good meeting. So what's your summer, end of summer been like, Kim? Well, uh, we've got my honey harvested. Good. And when you and I and Kirsten are done here today, I'm going to go out and put on some Formic Pro and get rid of my Varroa mites the easy way. <laughs> and, you, and you're going to put them... Put, <laughs> Much better than hand-picking, I can yes. guarantee you. <laughs> uh, well, good. Um, well, let us know how that goes. I will. I will. It's a, I'm, doing the, I'm doing the two strips, so it's, it's 14 days. Okay, okay. So in two weeks, I'll let you know. Well, wear your gloves. Yep. <laughs> hey, so Kirsten, uh, you've been busy besides Count and Varroa. Who's your interview today? Um, it's Steve Rogenstein. He's originally from New York, and then he relocated to Barcelona. And about a year and a half ago, he moved to Berlin, and he's very active in the Berlin community. Um, he was fascinating to talk to. We covered a whole range of subjects, everything from honey to um, the Varroa Task Force that Colos is organizing, where they're looking for survivor stock or wild feral bees. Well, I'm looking forward to that interview. Yeah, it should it should be good. I don't know much about that program, so it'll be good to get filled yeah. in. 
Yeah, it's a brand new program they're rolling out. So oh, good. Good. Oh, good. Good. Before we get to that, let's. Uh, hey, I just want to let our listeners know we've been receiving lots of emails, and and we thank you for the emails. We try to respond to them all. Uh, be patient if we don't get to your email right away. Uh, we appreciate your comments, encouragement, and and suggestions. Keep them coming. We enjoy them. And uh, before we get to it, last couple episodes, we've been mentioning the Fourth International Bee and Hive Monitoring Conference. That's coming up here October 5th through 9th. It's a webinar, right, Kim? Yeah, they've got so many people, Zoom wouldn't handle it. <laughs> no more Zoom there. They couldn't handle Zoom. That's one or the other. And and uh, so they have a, uh, they have panel discussion. No, how does that go, Kim? They have uh, individual speakers discussing individual topics. Yep, and 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 every one of the speakers gets about fifteen minutes, and and there'll be at the at the end of the day there'll be a um, uh, all of all of their their write ups will be published in Bee Culture magazine. Very good, and they'll have uh, the talk topics on on uh, the very hive monitoring tools, scales and sensors, uh, RFD RFID sense, uh, uh, solutions for research. Uh, just about everything, and it's only twenty. It's only bucks. twenty bucks. So check yep. that out. Uh, the link is in the show notes, and I encourage everybody to go. It's a great, great uh, several days of information on everything technology regarding bees and and hive monitoring. And for twenty dollars, it's a great deal. The science of th- or the Internet of Things is going to reign for a week. <laughs> <laughs> Hello, beekeepers. Your honeybees face a lot of challenges out there. Unbalanced food sources from monoculture crops, holding yards, drought, food shortages, antibiotics, pesticides, and pathogens like chalk brood. To overcome these challenges, your bees need the multiple bacteria that are in all nectars, pollens, and the environment. These bacteria aid honeybees' digestion and improve your honeybee's response and resilience to pesticides. Now you can help improve your honey colony health with a quick, easy, and safe to use product. Strong Microbials Super DFM Honeybee uses naturally occurring bacteria to restore the healthy gut biome of your honeybees. Check them out today at www.strongmicrobials.com. Thanks to Strong Microbials. Now, with that bit of business done, let's uh, get into Kirsten's interview with Steve Rogenstein. I'm guest host Kirsten Trainer, editor of Two Million Blossoms, protecting our pollinators. Today, I've invited Steve Rogenstein of the Ambassadors to chat with me about urban beekeeping, feral bees, and honey festivals. I was introduced to Steve by Phyllis Stiles, who founded Bee City USA. He's living in Berlin, Germany, so he's invited me to some of the bee events in the city. Steve, welcome to the show. Hi, thanks for having me. Oh, it's always great chatting bees. So Steve, (laughs) can you tell our listeners a bit about yourself and how you got into bees? Uh, Sure. Uh, I'm the founder of the Ambisadors, and we have a dual mission of connecting the bee community and spreading awareness of and appreciation for pollinators, especially honeybees through events, education, research, partnerships, advocacy, art, and more. Uh, how did I get into bees? Uh, it's a, a long story, and it has a big gap in between. But when I was about 10 or 11 years old in school, we had a substitute teacher in social studies. And to us, he was ancient. I mean, he must have been 80 years old or something like this. And he was talking about World War II and the experience. And nobody was really interested. So he tried a different tack and said, well, let me tell you about a hobby of mine. It's beekeeping. And the classroom literally erupted into complete chaos with spitballs and note passing and tossing and this and that and all this and he couldn't control it but there i was in the front you bro mouth agape absolutely riveted that he was keeping bees as pets and you could do that and it planted the seed in my head my little uh uh impressionable head that 
yeah, wow, another type of species that you can commune with. And then many, many years later, I was living in New York City and I found out that there were bees in community gardens and I was involved with some gardens. And this is pre-internet, obviously. And I was calling different uh, organizations and trying to volunteer and leave messages. And after months, I finally got invited to visit a beehive. So we got suited up. It was called the Liz Christie Garden on the corner of Houston and I think like First Avenue, bustling in the middle of the city. And it's this oasis. We got suited up. We climbed up on a shed and opened up the hive. And I was awed, completely <laughs> awed. They were telling me about things. And I said, yeah, I want to get involved. And nothing. And I tried volunteering at other places and nothing really happened. And I got distracted and got into composting and other projects. Uh, and then years and years later, a friend of mine was telling me that he had enrolled in a beekeeping class. And I hung up the phone and signed up immediately. And Megan Pasco was my instructor in a very theoretical class-based two-day intro to beekeeping. And that's when it started. Okay. And the, the, the interest turned into a hobby, turned into a passion, turned into a complete obsession. <laughs> and now my life is basically dedicated to bees. And I and and you obviously did not wait until you were eighty and unable to climb up on sheds. <laughs> no, I waited definitely too long, but <laughs> never too late. Well, this is this is very good. And from New York, you ended up in Barcelona. So bees in Barcelona. How did you convince a Spanish city to host a honey festival? Uh, well. I went to Barcelona for a number of reasons and didn't really think it through that maybe they wouldn't have urban beekeeping and they did not. So I was shocked. And before I had moved there, I had done some networking and lined up a couple of meetings for uh, when I first arrived. And a woman uh, told me about the history and why the bees aren't legal. And I said, well, it seems to me to be a, uh, perception issue. Like why are bees not welcome in this city, but they're in New York and London and Berlin and Paris and elsewhere. So maybe they just have a, a unreasonable fear or maybe it's just inertia and there was a law and they never changed it. So I suggested having uh, produced the New York City Honey Festival and Honey Week uh, two years in a row, 2013 and 14, uh, I propose that maybe we do an event that introduces the public to bees. And if we could sign enough names on petitions, perhaps we could go to the city and repeal these laws prohibiting it. And that's how the Honey Festival got born. Uh, did we convince the city? Not necessarily. However, one of my partners was managing an apiary, ironically, in the middle of the city. It was the city's apiary, so they could have bees, but <laughs> it was, quote unquote, for scientific purposes. Okay. So he was already in touch with the people from the Department of Biodiversity and Green Spaces. And with their permission, we got to use that location in the, in the, the Ciutadela, the park in the middle of the city. Uh, and they helped us. They gave us some money. They enabled us to uh, use the space and did some pub publicity for us. So, so but you're still not allowed to keep bees within Barcelona unless you have a science exemption. Yeah, although I was involved with an art project at the Joan Miro Foundation, which is a museum up in one of the, uh, in the hill, Montjuic. Okay. And they did an exhibition called Behave, which was about bees, art, and the city. Interesting. And the curator actually convinced the city to allow one of the artists to install hives on top of the roof that were connected with fiber optics and microphones and 
cameras into an art piece within the gallery itself. So that was, I think, like a six-month uh, allowance for keeping bees in the city. Okay, very cool. And so do beekeepers keep their hives then on the outskirts of the city or...? They do. There are okay. some gorilla hives in the city, okay. uh, but the majority of people actually keep it outside in the city. And, 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 and right outside of Barcelona, there's countryside, so it's very easy okay. if you have, if you have very, public transportation. Yeah, and, and so the Honey Festival itself, how long was the event? Was it a one-day event? Participants? It is still a one-day event. We just decided to cancel it which was supposed to be in October, but obviously with Corona and the threat of a second wave, uh, we just decided not to take that risk. Uh, sure. So it would have been in its fourth year. And it's a one day event at the moment with a marketplace, workshops, lectures, uh, honey tasting. We did uh, screenings and other kind of activities to really educate and engage the public uh, and teach them about bees. Very, very, very cool. And are you trying to get something similar off the ground in Berlin? I mean, Berlin is a very, very different, very green city with with lots of beekeepers keeping bees in the city. Well, funny you should ask, because just this week I had a meeting with somebody who was running a honey event. Okay. That you could call a festival. And she is unfortunately moving from Berlin. Uh, and I said, hey, what do you feel about me taking over your event or starting <laughs> a new one? And she said, do it. So this was the idea. Obviously, I've been going from city to city starting honey festivals, but uh, the idea has been germinated. So I need to start thinking about who, who are the partners going to be? Where are we going to do it? When are we going to do it? So that's actually something that's exciting. Very, very, very cool. And um you have quite a background in event management. Is that correct? Yes. Yes, it is true. <laughs> um, so, we don't need to go into the background, but I've been doing events professionally since a long time, the early 90s. Okay. And, uh, it's just, it's in my DNA. So I take advantage of all this experience and connections and... In the bee world lately, uh, I co-produced the Learning from the Bees in Berlin conference and workshop in 2019, okay. which had an emphasis on natural beekeeping and Zeidlerei, which is tree beekeeping and rewilding bees. Uh, and then I've been doing events that are more intimate, such as honey tastings, and cooking classes with honey, uh, going to schools and teaching kids about uh, bees and doing mini honey tastings or workshops, making seed bombs or doing waggle dances. Uh, and we're trying to do more of this locally. However, okay. obviously, Corona has really put a wrench in that plan. Yes. So prior, prior to Corona, let's imagine Corona didn't exist. Um, how would one of these honey, honey tasting events take place? Would you, were they large gatherings, small groups? Um, how many honeys were you were allowing participants to taste? And how do you, how do you collect all your honeys from around the world? <laughs> uh obsession did i mention that <laughs> uh so the, the formal honey tastings are pretty intimate uh i don't like to do more than 24 people because okay. to have everybody around one table is really nice uh and you can have this shared experience uh or in one small room which is what happened the last one that we did uh right before corona here in berlin and it's basically a journey through the senses and having this experiential uh, introduction to honey. Uh, so we go through kind of a trivial facts and really kind of did you know uh, aha moments about honey. Uh, then we go into what it is, how it's produced. We talk about the different senses and perceptions so we play some games, some sensory games, where you try to identify what is in an opaque 
container. Uh, and then we used a honey wheel that was developed by Marina Marchese and Kim Flotun. Surprise, surprise. Uh, that is featured in the Honey Connoisseur book. And it's basically an aroma and taste wheel that helps you to identify and articulate what it is that you're smelling and or tasting. Okay. So we isolate the sense of smell. We isolate the sense of taste. We fuse them together to create flavor and taste. Interesting. And, and then we taste uh, a variety of honeys. So the last one was in partnership with a guy from Greece who imports Greek honeys. So we sample Greek honeys. Okay. Uh, the one before was honeys around the world. We had from Greece and Madagascar and Bulgaria and Spain and of course Germany. Uh, and how do I collect the honeys? I, I travel, so... <laughs> so you're <laughs> I, secretly I, sneaking jars back in your suitcase. Yeah, not secretly at all. <laughs> uh, I recently went to Apimondia, which was in Montreal, and there on the exhibition hall, you have so many people who have honeys from around the world that they're sampling, selling, and or uh, giving away. Yes. So in that case, it was really important to just get 100 milliliters or less but there were a couple that were a little over that had crystallized. So I thought maybe I could get them onto the plane. And I asked the woman at the counter, hey, I have honey and I don't want them to get like confiscated. She's like, no problem. I'll just put it under, check it in and uh, no fee and no problem. You can take all your honeys home. Wow, like, that's unusual. Yeah. An, airline, an airline agent who was helpful. <laughs> yeah, and I was like, darn it, I could have brought so many more honeys home. <laughs> so the honey collection has just uh, expanded. I think I have, at this point, more than 250 or so. So my, my problem with, with honey collection is I buy honey everywhere I go. I buy quite a lot of it. Um, my problem is I use it pretty much as rapidly as I purchase it. <laughs> So, so my honey collection keeps disappearing because it gets consumed. Yeah, well, that's my problem too. Is that oh, I want to keep this one. Oh, this one's precious. Oh, this. Oh, wait, which one am I going to have in breakfast this morning? So, so yeah. I have yeah, to buy the, the 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 common honeys that I can use, you know, indiscriminately for a cereal, and then I have the special honeys for the tastings and uh, the samplings with friends and for special occasions. That, that makes total sense. Yeah, I, I once had a chance to, to meet Marina Marchese at, um, believe it or not, a, a, a Jewish food, food New Year's festival um, where she was invited to do a honey tasting, but she was doing it for 85 people, <laughs> which, yeah. which is tough. That's a tough crowd. Um, and the one thing I remember is that she'd given everybody uh, a little container of sugar and cinnamon but had us smell it with our nose closed and you couldn't tell there was cinnamon in it um, even when you tasted it unless your nose was open uh, it was fascinating she actually participated in the new york honey festival okay and was one of our judges for the honey contest and subsequently i asked her if she would do a honey tasting in this salon series that I was curating. So she was the first formal honey tasting uh, course that I ever kind of organized. And I had actually uh, attended one of her events up in Connecticut. So she is the one that basically introduced me to honey tastings, formal honey tastings. So I do owe uh, a lot of the knowledge and inspiration to her. Yeah, she 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 takes it incredibly seriously. I mean, she's gone to Italy for training and everything, so um, she's always fascinating to talk with. Yeah, and actually, it's a good segue to a next topic, perhaps, but uh, one of her mentors and uh, trainers is Rafael Dalo Daloli. Okay. Daolio. Uh, and he and I are working on a project right now. And uh, Marina actually introduced us at Apimondia, and it has exploded into probably one of the event not events, but uh, projects for me that I'm most proud of, at least at this juncture. And tell us more. What is this project about? Uh, it's called Honeybee Watch. 
Okay. It is a, a global citizen science project, and the purpose is to study the traits of survivorship among untreated and or free living honeybee colonies. Uh, it's an initiative of COLAS, the Survivors Task Force. Okay. And they are the world's largest association of honeybee scientists. And basically what we're doing is a pilot program in Germany in 2021, uh, whereby we're trying to identify as many colonies that fit these criteria as possible. So untreated and or free living. So they can be in apiaries, they can be in trees, in chimneys, in cliff sides. Uh, and if we can get what we're calling bee guardians, uh, citizens to observe these and provide us with uh, regular monitoring uh, observations and, and measurements, we can then send out scientists to do sampling and do lab uh, tests to find out what are the traits for survivorship. Okay, uh, so, you, I, so, so you're basically trying to engage a lot of ears on the ground, eyes on the ground with, with citizen scientists, and then they interact with um, sampling teams, I guess, who would come out and probably sample some bees and analyze genetics and see how, how these feral, wild living populations are different from um, the ones managed in apiaries nearby. Uh, exactly. Um, okay. And, and, and what we're also, we have two groups of data providers. We have the citizens who are mm -hmm. predominantly individuals. So they could be beekeepers, bird watchers, gardeners, whomever. And then what we're trying to do is form an international consortium of research partners. So universities, uh, bee labs, professors, researchers, scientists, et cetera, uh, that are already doing this kind of research. Okay. And we have partners in Italy and Ireland, in France. Uh, we're talking with organizations uh, in Luxembourg, in the United States, in Germany, in the UK. And if we can bring everybody together to create this larger international database, we think that it could be really helpful for better understanding wild bees. Right, uh, and, and we're located here in Europe, so Apis mellifera is native and wild. Uh, and then the naturalized bees, who we would call feral colonies in other places like the Americas or Australia, for instance. Okay. There's no widespread data on wild colonies and right. what's happening there. A uh, and, and I'm – oh, go ahead. I was going to say, and especially the Asian honeybees. Right. And, and we're also working with, well, trying to work with the IUCN, International Union for Conservation of Nature, who okay. are the ones that determine who is on the red list as threatened, as uh, endangered, et cetera. So trying to fill in the data gaps because currently Apis mellifera, wild Apis mellifera is quote unquote data deficient. Yeah. Well, I mean, and it's just, it's really hard. I'm sure you guys have had arguments about definitions of, of what's wild and, and what's, <laughs> what's not wild. I can imagine sur survivorship is defined very differently depending on, on your belief system. Um, yeah, so. <laughs> actually, the science team met this week and we had basically a two-hour conversation about defining terms in the glossary. Yeah. And it's it's a real challenge because, you know, what is a professional beekeeper? Mm -hmm. What is survivorship? What is untreated? Yeah. So all of these terms need to be defined not only internally amongst the scientists and the research partners, but externally to the citizens so they know what we're talking about. Right. Because, I mean, there's a lot of there's a lot of bees that are untreated but highly managed. And then there's bees that are unmanaged and untreated. And then you have, you know, escapees that just happen to keep finding the same location, but they're dying out each year and a new one ends up in there. And, and so. And therefore, um, <laughs> is it a surviving colony or is it a or is it just a colony or an yeah. established colony? Yeah. It's, it's, 
it's a challenge, but uh, you know, we're we're plotting away. Okay, and and so if people are interested in getting involved, for example, if they live near a forest and they've noticed or are doing bee lining and they've noticed some surviving colonies, how can they let you know that they they want to report them and maybe participate? I hope they do want to participate. Uh, it's honeybeewatch.com. Okay. Uh, spelled out one word, just as it sounds. Uh, currently, we have a preliminary survey, which is trying to identify locations. And by location, we mean just basically a postal code. We're not looking for GPS coordinates at the moment. And then abundance. So how many? So what we can start assessing is where these are distributed and what kind of the density of populations are. And currently, the science team is working on the second protocol, the second survey, which will be more in-depth monitoring and profiling of these colonies. Okay. And eventually, the vision is for us to create a social network whereby you set up your user profile, kind of like a Facebook or another kind of platform like that. And then you can start interacting on different levels to find out if you're a commercial beekeeper, what are other commercial beekeepers finding? Uh, or if you keep uh, a skep hive, for instance, you can find out who else has skep hives by me. Or if you're located in France, where is what's the distribution of free living colonies in France? So there will be a lot of interactivity that we're hoping to uh, incorporate into this app and or interactive website, but that's a couple of years down the line. And this is a multi-year project. It could go on for 20 years as, as, as far as we know. Right. No, I'm sure. And getting, getting these things off the ground is, is always building the, the strong foundation is the hard part. So you guys, you guys are stuck with the, the difficult task of definitions and figuring out how, how to, um, logically and intelligently get people involved and, and still process all the information and make it usable. So um, and, I don't and, I don't envy the task. <laughs> yeah, and finding the funding and yeah. convincing the partners that we want to be more collaborative than kind of, uh, you know, pilfering. And yeah, it's, it's, it's a challenge, but we're super committed. Uh, everybody we talk to expresses interest. There may be some reticence to jump aboard, but we need to figure out what the relationship is between Honeybee Watch, what these research partners, uh, whose data is, who's, who can access the data, what do we do with the data, et cetera. Very cool. Well, I wish you much success with it and good luck with the funding. Usually the EU is pretty good about trying to protect um, their species. So I have a feeling you guys will be able to make a good pitch to, to get some money yeah, and, to help support and, it. And the underlying uh, objective is really knowing how to conserve these wild honeybee populations, especially for genetic diversity. Right. And I mean, there are some, you know, there's remote islands in, in much of Europe where some true Apis mellifera, mellifera stock still exists. Mm -hmm. There's pockets in the mountains towards, towards Eastern Europe um, where there's still feral bees. So yeah, I, I, my guess is that just for the genetic repository, um, you, you'll be able to find funding because there's been so much concern over us losing um the bee diversity that was once in the population. So, well, it's, if it's, you if you okay. have any suggestions, <laughs> I'm, I could I'm make any learning, introductions. <laughs> I, I'm still learning the EU funding system, but um, uh, yeah, let me let me think about it, and maybe maybe we can come up with some creative ideas for for um, pitching the importance to to the powers that be. Yeah, so. or if any of your listeners have any suggestions. Oh, we we love millionaires <laughs> who love throwing throwing money at bee bee projects. <laughs> yes, send us your white knights. Better Bee is pleased to present the interviews by Kirsten Trainer. As a supplier to our nation's beekeepers for over forty years, Better Bee provides the tools, equipment, and information you need to succeed. 
Through its many beekeeping employees, Better Bee serves you with solutions to your beekeeping challenges. That's why they can say with confidence that they are your partners in Better Beekeeping. Thanks to Better Bee for their informative catalog, website, supportive beekeeper education, and for sponsoring the series featuring Kirsten. Be sure to see the latest at betterbee.com. So you've been in Berlin, you've moved from Barcelona. What has surprised you most about the city and its bees? Uh, Well, from Barcelona, which is a medieval city that is basically paved over, surrounded by a couple of major parks to without urban beekeeping to come to Berlin, which is this expansive green city with beekeeping everywhere. What always surprises me is that you're walking through a cemetery and, Oh, look, there are some beehives <laughs> or, Oh, there's a schoolyard and there are beehives and they're, they're really, I mean, I wouldn't say ubiquitous, but, uh, it's surprising where you find beehives. Yes, I, I fully concur. And I think the whole attitude to beehives is different. I remember being at the the day of the open door at the Institute of Bee Research in Celle, Germany, and they were catching queens. Um, they were late season queens that were being sold off to beekeepers who needed to requeen prior to the winter. And they had a crowd of about 30 standing around, not a veil in sight, young children right up front, bees are flying everywhere, and nobody was concerned. I just, I'm trying to picture that in the United States and all the liability signs that would be around it. Whereas here, I think people are just like, oh, there's a beehive, let's walk on up. Um, And even in the cemeteries, they have observation hives, and you just, you can go right on up, open the door, take a peek at the bees, see what's going on. Yeah. Uh, I think that it's, you know, very much part of your East European and Central European heritage to have bees. Uh, And I think the numbers may be off, but if I'm not mistaken, I think there are like 180,000 beekeepers in Germany, which is a huge amount of people. And 90% or 80% of them are hobbyists. So, you know, you have a lot of people who are connected to bees and whether they have a backyard, whether they're a grandfather or grandparents or uncle or cousins had bees or keeps bees. There is a story that everybody has here that connects them to the bees. Yeah, no, most definitely. And I mean, there's always multiple beekeepers at any market. Um, I think people value the different varietal honeys that are available for sale in Germany. Um, Whereas in the U.S., I think people are often surprised that honey doesn't always taste like the traditional clover honey you grew up with. Um, So, In in the bear jar on the the supermarket shelf. (laughs) That's always the same color. (laughs) Always the same color and consistency all year round. How is that possible? Yeah. (laughs) <laughs> the there's actually the squeeze bear is actually funny because it was invented by Gamber Container in in Pennsylvania, um, I think shortly after World War II when when um, Winnie the Pooh was super popular, um, and the original the original bears had hand painted eyes on them, which is a little creepy when you see them. <laughs> Cute. <laughs> so, but yeah, they they I, I, they they took off. I guess that was a good marketing uh, ploy because they became very popular. Yes. No, they've, they've done phenomenally well. I mean, most most drawings representing honey in the U.S. are always your squeeze bear with the little red top. So um, mm-hmm. I, I, I personally like the wide mouth glass jars because it's much easier to spoon them um, out. Then there's always that honey at the bottom of the bear that there's no way of getting out unless you add hot water. Um, yeah, so. I'm also not a fan of plastic containers. I much yeah. prefer glass. The the only benefit of plastic is is weight when traveling or shipping. <laughs> That's true. That's true. So, so can... speaking of honey, mm-hmm. is it true that you were able to give Angela Merkel some I, honey? I did. I when I was um, a German Chancellor Fellow. Back in 2006, 2007, I was at the Institute of Bee Research in Celle, Germany, and we were invited for a brief invite to meet with Merkel and have a photo op. 
Um, and so I brought two jars of honey as a gift, um, and I gifted them to her, and I got a very nice thank you letter afterwards. Um, but apparently I broke protocol. So we, we only had, I think, a 20-minute window with her. And you're not allowed to give the chancellor a gift unless you spend more than 30 minutes. Luckily, she, she didn't reject my gift. Everybody seems to love honey. Um, that's one of the things I love about honey is it cuts across all social barriers and boundaries and classes. Uh, and it's, it's almost always appreciated, even by people who say they don't like honey. And then they try it and they're like, but this doesn't taste like the honey I have in the store. Well, actually, that's a good point, because when we do the honey tastings, what I try to do is include this real huge range. So you have the, the, the very sweet, kind of light acacia type honeys, and you go through the whole gamut all the way to what, uh, what I think is one of the bitterest, which is the Madroño in Spain. It's the Arbutus uh, Unedo, the strawberry fruit tree. Oh, I've and never it, had that. It is just sometimes, wow. And, it, and it's funny because you go into a schoolyard and you're doing a honey tasting with this, this complete juxtaposition. And some kids love the bitter honey and some kids hate it. And it's funny because as, as you're going around and they're tasting it, you can see from the faces like, Ooh, Right, right. They're not very good at hiding their emotions. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> and then a show of hands, who liked this one and who liked this one? And, and it's, it's, it's interesting to see how people's tastes are so different. Yeah, no, definitely. Do you have a favorite honey of all the honeys you've ever tasted? That's a very unfair question. But... Oh, gosh. Um, I have probably four favorite honeys. Okay. There's... Four is pretty good. <laughs> um, there was an unidentified honey from an octogenarian in Greece that my, my friend, the, the Greek importer, uh, shared with me. And it tastes, uh, it's, 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 it's like the purest pine or fir forest honey. I'm a honeydew fan. Okay. Uh, but it smells like bubble gum. It's crazy. So, and I love that kind of surprise of, oh. It smells like feet, but wow, it tastes like caramel or, you know, it smells like bubble gum, but tastes like the best honey I've ever tried. Uh, the one that smells like sweat, but tastes like caramel is a eucalyptus from Madagascar. Okay. Um, and there was a cherry blossom that I had in Spain that I opened the jar and it was like spring jumped out of the jar. And Unusual. It's, Cherry blossoms really hard to get. It was probably the, the highest concentration of cherry blossom that I've ever tried. And it was, it smelt and tasted like cherry blossoms. And I'm, unfortunately, this is one of those honeys that I was like, I'm keeping this forever. But of course, from oxidation, I the lost flavor. the fragrance and yeah. the flavor change. Yeah. Interesting. Yeah, cherry blossom is one of those crops that's so early that it usually ends up going into bees and not into honey. Um, so it goes into brood rearing. But that was only three. What was the fourth? Come on, don't hold back. Oh, gosh. <laughs> um, I'm looking over at my shelf, but it, it's, it's, it's been uh, diminished because I've been moving a lot. There's from... Uh, I think, oh, it's a dandelion. That's what it is. A dandelion from Montreal. Interesting. Uh, okay. it's, it, the texture is just this wonderful creaminess that melts in your mouth. It's like butter. Oh, nice. Those are um, the finely crystallized. Aren't lovely? And, and it, of that same texture, there's a rapeseed from Bulgaria that, oh. <laughs> actually, no, this is white honey from Hawaii. Huh. And I don't know what it's called, but long story, my dad did a promotion and bought jars and jars and jars of like little sample jars mm -hmm. and had too many and gave them all to me. And I ate all those like, <laughs> I, they'd be gone in one sitting, like each jar. So interesting. And I've never had it since, but I need to. Need you to need to track that. that down. Yeah, yeah. One of my, one of my favorites is red beach from New Zealand. 
um, which is a honeydew honey as well. And that that's incredible. If I'm not mistaken, Ben Moore loves that too. Ooh, okay. Yeah, it's it's New Zealand honeys. I think we're probably the most, when I was visiting, the most diverse assortment of flavors I've ever come across in honey because they are so different in, in flavor profiles than what you encounter in Europe and the United States. So I, that I, was... That was amazing. I took a honey sensory, a honey sensory tasting course in Tenerife. Ooh. And again, one of these islands with endemic plant species, yep. they have really unique uh, honeys. And that was really difficult for me because I was living in Spain and was familiar with the continental honeys. Yeah. Which is like, you know, there's like 40 different honeys that are common. And going to ten- uh, Tenerife and then saying, Hey, try to identify this in a blind tasting. And I had <laughs> no idea. I'd never even heard of these plants before. Right. And the, the flavor profiles were just like, wow. So I, I was not very good at identifying the different honeys. I That's could get totally I could always, Yeah, I could always I can always get a chestnut. And okay. acacia is pretty easy. And Mother Onio is super easy for me as well. And a couple of others. I love thyme honey. Mm, yeah, very flavorful. Yeah. The the one that's super popular here in in Germany that I'm I'm not yet convinced I like is heather honey. Um, it has a medicinal tang to it. It I find. is medicinal. Yeah. Super medicinal. So it it has a long history of of it's a very iron rich honey and so it it has a long history in, of of being used for for different ailments. Um, but the flavor of it, I always, I always feel a little bit like I'm, I'm, I'm eating medicine, which I'm fine with eating medicine when I want medicine. But as, as a flavor profile for, for enjoyment, it's, I, it's still not, it's still not quite in my palate. So I think you and I should go to Tisaloniki, which okay. is the Greek importer, and he has some Erica, the heather honey. Oh, from I've Greece. never had Greek. Heather. That is really wonderful. Okay, so I totally be. I would. I'm totally down for that. So, thank thank you so much. Is there anything I didn't ask you that you wish I had? Uh, if you want to know more about the Invisadors, uh, uh-huh. we do local events. We do global uh, initiatives. Uh, you can find us at ambassadors.com, and that's spelled A M B E E S S A D O R S dot com. Uh, And we have projects that are research-based that anybody can participate in. We have events. We're doing online series, uh, a speaker series. Uh, Unfortunately, the next one's sold out, but we have an Egyptologist talking about bees in ancient Egypt. And we reviewed the presentation yesterday, and wow, people are (laughs) going to be blown away. Very, very cool. Yes, and, I, and some of the first beekeepers with real bee management, so I'm sure it's fascinating. Yeah, exactly. And uh, we're going to do a speaker series next year, uh, 2021, and you can find out about that through the Ambassadors or the College of the Melissa. And Melissa is spelled M-E-L-I-S-S-A-E dot com. Okay, and we will include those links in our show notes as well so people can find them and just click on them. Great. Um, but I love it. Ambassadors, ambassadors for bees. It's a, it's a great, great name. It came to me on the dance floor. <laughs> <laughs> An so, inspiring moment. Before I let you go, the one final thing I ask everybody, if you had to pick an avatar, a pollinator avatar to represent you online, what would it be? Oh, goodness. <laughs> I would have to go for a green sweat bee because it's so majestic with its iridescence. And I just can't believe that that exists in nature. It's gorgeous. Ooh, I love it. Yeah, they're adorable. I, I, I always, they, they do tickle a little bit when they land on you, um, but I, I always enjoy them. They're, they're such gorgeous colors. Yeah. So Any I questions? actually have an article on, on why bees are blue coming up in my next issue. So. Stay tuned. <laughs> yeah, that's, that, I'll read that. So, yeah, it, it has to do with structural coloration. It's not pigment. It's very fascinating. Okay. So, 
Well, thank you. Something else to learn from 2 Million Blossoms. (laughs) So, well, thank you so much, Steve. I I really enjoyed our chat, and I'm going to hold you to that honey date uh, for Greek um, heather honey. You're on. All right. Take care. Thank you. Bye. (laughs) Bye Bye-bye. Hey, thanks, Kirsten, for bringing us, Steve, to the, the podcast. It was really great. He's, God, he's, for, for being there, um, he did not get lost in Europe. He definitely settled down and is very active. Yeah, he, he has his, his um, bee love has taken him far, and he's in all sorts of projects. So you, you never quite know what he's going to be up to next. <laughs> uh, basically, yeah, basically a really uh, uh, diver- biodiversity exists in that guy, I think. That's a good way to do it. <laughs> I like I like the part about honey tasting where when he first started uh, and he was working with Marina. You know, we've had Marina on the show. We've talked about the book and and the tasting wheel. That was good to hear that. And then over to the Varroa thing. I mean, he was all over the map, but and there was a lot a lot touched on a lot of things. It was good to hear. Yeah, yeah, it, and it's funny how interconnected the world is. So um, he he was had invited an Egyptologist to present to one of the beekeeping groups he's part of. And so then he stumbled across a review I had written on on um, Kritsky's book on on beekeeping in in ancient Egypt, and so there's all these funny little interconnections. And um, Marina's actually written an article for my issue that's currently with the printer and will be shipping in in next week, um, where we include the tasting wheels. So um, it's it, she did a beautiful job and in, has incorporated some of her own artwork, and it's an absolutely phenomenal layout. Yeah, she's fun to work with, that's for sure. I look forward to reading that. She is good. All right, well, that about wraps it up for this podcast. Before we go, I want to encourage our listeners to rate us five stars on Apple Podcasts, wherever you download and stream the show. Your vote helps other beekeepers find us quicker. Even better, write a review and let us know what you like. As always, we thank Bee Culture, the magazine for American beekeeping, for continuing their support of Beekeeping Today podcast. We want to thank our regular episode sponsor, Global Patties. Check them out at www.globalpatties.com. We also want to thank Strong Microbials for becoming the latest supporter of the podcast. Check out their probiotic line at www.strongmicrobials.com. And finally, and most importantly, we want to thank you, the Beekeeping Today podcast listener, for joining us on this show. Feel free to send us questions and comments at questions at beekeepingtodaypodcast.com. We'd love to hear from you. Hey, guys, anything else we want to mention? I just want to say thanks, Kirsten, for bringing some eclectic guests on air. Uh, yeah. you, you, you know a lot of interesting people, and it's fun to listen to. Oh, why, thank you. I, I try to get some people who haven't been on other shows and, and eclectic people who come come across my path who I enjoy talking with. So. Yeah, it shows. It's good. It's fun. Thanks. Thank you. 